the first question I wanted to ask you is what drove you to write this book as well as uh, to tell us more about the process of researching it and writing it. So what did you feel was wrong uh, or missing or inadequate in discussions about the Syrian conflict? What kind of research did you do in order to write it? And what kind of challenges did you confront as a researcher, whether it's sort of logistical challenges or even ethical challenges? If you can talk, tell us a little bit about those things to start off would be great. Yeah, so um, since 2011, the work writing research on Syria has boomed. It's become an industry and there is um, a lot of books that have been published, articles, um, research um, about Syria since, since then. And I think um, a lot of it um, has a number of problems. Um, the main problem uh, with the um, research and knowledge production about Syria is that it takes a geopolitical lens. It looks at Syria from the perspective of state, international relation, um, regional and international powers. And um, the main problem with that is that for the most part, um, many of those writings don't recognize, cannot see the Syrian revolution. And I think the short answer for that is that uh, state and state-centric analyses uh, prevent us from seeing what's happening on the ground. They're interested in the state as an entity, they're interested in state um, conflict, interest, uh, state relations, and all the thinking is revolving around those issues. Um, what kind of relationship uh, are there between the Syrian state, the Syrian regime, or other um, state in the region? And everything is limited and reduced to uh, thinking around uh, state um, actors. Um, and so the Syrian revolution obviously uh, cannot be grasped, cannot be understood uh, through that lens of the state. And we have to shift our understanding, our thinking to be able to, to, to view what's happening. So, um, so that was the main motivation for writing the book, trying to uh, think and examine what happened in Syria from, from below, trying to give a voice to people who have been struggling on the ground, who have been completely invisibilized, who have been completely erased uh, from, from that story of, of the revolution. And uh, looking at the different scale from um, the, sta the, the state level to the individual or the interpersonal level, which is, I think, a difficult task because you have to have access, you have to be there, you have to talk to people. To people. And oftentimes that narrative is quite chaotic. It's multi-dimensional. Um, it doesn't necessarily have a clear and clean narrative. Um, it's plurivocal. People ha are saying different things. They come from different perspectives. And so it's about uh, gathering a lot of material and trying to process it and trying to, to see through it and identify a kind of thread um, through all that. Um, and what complexify also the, 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 the task is that politics was uh, almost inexistent in Syria for a simple reason. I mean, it was a totalitarian state. Um, it, uh, any form of politics was forbidden. Uh, people who tried to um, create a political sphere were oftentimes uh, crushed. Um, they were exiled. They were um, kidnapped, tortured. They were put in prison. And so the political sphere is almost inexistent and people don't necessarily have um, the political, the, I would say, traditional political knowledge. And so they were experimenting with a lot of different tools and discourses and um, practices that um, were about trial and error. Oftentimes it wasn't necessarily about um, knowing a, a way of doing things, but rather trying. So that was, I think, the main motivation. The second one is um, trying to push back against some of the Orientalist narratives that bring um, theories from the West and try to apply them almost um, without any kind of critical um, sense. And I, I, I take the example of um, social movement or new social movement theory, um, which was developed in the West and was developed for social movement in the West, obviously. Um, movement that operate within a public sphere, within civil society, and have some margin of maneuver, and they can do a number of things. That, that kind of space doesn't, doesn't exist in places like Syria. 
And therefore, uh, all this apparatus of the new social movement, I think, is not applicable or is inapplicable. The idea that there are uh, groups that um, uh, make demands to the state and the state listen, and there are some kind of procedure, and there is a legal uh, sphere, and um, there is like a, a check and balances and different institutions through which people can go and so on. Is uh, is in existent, and therefore I think that um, social movement and new social movement theories are not applicable in in places like like Syria. So um, that was um, part of the reason why I wanted to write a book that pushes against those kind of um, kind of sim simplistic reading, Eurocentric uh, readings, and also state centric uh, readings. Was there also a question about ethics? Well, just uh, thank you, Yasser. That was great. I was just uh, asking if you could tell us what were the challenges. Uh, you alluded to some of them in terms of access, but can you take us through the process of researching it, your experiences of uh, being able to um, uh, travel to uh, Syria or uh, the neighboring countries and the process of researching the book and also the challenges that you confronted whether they're ethical or other challenges, what were some of the main obstacles or challenges you had to overcome to write the book? So the main challenge is obviously the question of access. Um, and oftentimes, if you are talking to a, a group of people, um, people assume that you are in some ways um, against other, other groups. Uh, even within the opposition, uh, sometimes there was a kind of a difficult and complex relationship. Um, so navigating and going from one group to another, trying to hear from different perspective was almost understood as betrayal. So for example, um, I had a number of occasion, um, I did interviews with people who were opposed to the Revolutionary Council in, in Menbej. And the, simply, I mean, the fact of meeting with them and talking to them was perceived as a form of betrayal and why would you do that? And they are counter-revolutionary. Why would you even listen to to that those voices? So there is this this challenge um, of, um, of of talking to people in in various spaces. The other challenge is obviously the monumental violence, constant violence. Uh, I mean, the, the Syrian regime was dropping bombs. Um, Menbej is far from the front line, but uh, the the Syrian regime was often targeting it, and uh, for for a simple reason. We can talk about that um, a bit later. But um, the simple reason is that the Syrian regime, I think, was more afraid, especially in the beginning, from uh, the emergence of alternatives to authoritarian rule, uh, much more scared of that dimension than the military aspect of, of the conflict, and wanted to prevent um, people from, from building those alternatives, uh, anything that could resemble to a post-Assad Syria. And therefore, um, it was interested in um, always dropping bombs, even if there was no uh, necessary strategic or military uh, uh, reason for, for doing so. Uh, and so um, I was navigating through that. I mean, um, trying to produce uh, research and talk to people in the context of monumental violence is always difficult. And when you are receiving the bombs, uh, when you are in Menbej and you see people being killed by the Syrian regime bombs, uh, you're not objective. And I think um, it's it's um, misleading to claim any kind of uh, objectivity. Uh, and so my book is not objective. It's not neutral. It, it, it takes a stance. But I think the challenge is to kind of have, uh, have uh, some kind of balance between the ethical and the political, between um, the 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 peaceful movement and the, mil the military, the violent uh, uh, movement. Um, very quickly, Syrian discovered that it's impossible to um, to topple the Syrian regime through peaceful organizing um, only. And therefore, the revolution became militarized um, very quickly. And that makes it even harder to, to operate and to have uh, some semblance of, of, of democracy and preventing the military faction from taking over the civilian and, and so on. So those were some of the challenges um, that, that I encountered. 
Great. Thank you so much. So having said all that, can you take us on a brief tour of the book? What are the different sections of the book? And just briefly tell us what each of them talks about. We're going to talk about in a second, the last chapter, which I found uh, particularly interesting, which is the uh, story of Minbij and the uh, alternative councils that were formed there, the revolutionary councils. But take us through other parts of the book, just so people know what else is there. So for the most part, what, what I wanted to do with the book is experiment with different theoretical tools in each one of the chapters to avoid um, seeing class conflict uh, everywhere or uh, questions of, I mean, if someone is Foucauldian and bringing a Foucauldian perspective or analysis, uh, they're going to be simply interested in questions of power. If they're Gramscian, they're going to see hegemony everywhere. Uh, a Marxian perspective would uh, reduce, I think, sometimes everything to class analysis and class conflict and accumulation and, and so on. So I wanted to experiment with different theoretical uh, tools in each one of the chapters, and that's why um, I bring different voices in each one of the chapters. Uh, the first one, try to understand the question of uh, violence and the state of exception. The, state, the question of violence does, doesn't start in 2011, obviously. Uh, it starts with uh, the rise to power of the Ba'ath Party in 1963. And it should be understood as such. And uh, the question of the state of exception, um, how um, the, uh, the Syrian regime operate in a, a space where the legal is, um, is outside um, the sphere of uh, everyday life. Uh, and the state of exception is the rule rather than the exception. And, uh, and so people were operating in that kind of context. Um, Syria was... Um, um, was named the uh, the kingdom of silence by by Riyadh al Turk for that for that reason, and so what I try to do in the first chapter is to look at the different modalities, uh, the topography of death, the different forms of of death, the macro scale of death and the micro, uh, the velocity of death, uh, the scale of of death, um, and and so on and so forth, and uh, try to use um, that approach or that um, lens to, to understand what, what's happening. The second one, the second chapter is about the geography of death in, in Aleppo. And um, I deploy a kind of um, spatial analysis to understand what happened in the city and how the regime was able to take it back. And the different ways the regime weaponized the demographics of, of, the, um, of the city against the population. So opposing poor and rich, Muslim and Christian, Arab and Kurds, young and old, informal settlement to wealthy neighborhood, um, rural and urban, and so on and so forth. Uh, fragmenting the, the territory in different ways um, and opposing the different population to each other and um, preparing uh, the terrain to take over. I also look at horizontal and vertical power. The horizontal um, power and um, the deployment of that horizontal power uh, allowed the regime to move quickly to certain neighborhoods. So, for example, um, the militias and the, the group that patrol different neighborhoods, the checkpoint that were erected in different neighborhoods, that's the horizontal power. The vertical power is about complete dominance over the sky and dropping the bomb, but also the positioning of the snipers on uh, high rises and high structures. And what I found interesting, when you look at um, the different high rises and the high structures, you identify the different powers that the Syrian regime utilized. So for example, there is the citadel in the old Aleppo and the minaret, the mosques, that's the traditional religious power. Then you have the bureaucratic power. The city hall was one of the high rises and there were a number of very lethal snipers positioned there. And we're killing people in different uh, in different places. Oftentimes, targeting. I mean, they would play. Uh, one day they would say, "Let's target um, pregnant pre pregnant pregnant women." The next day, let's um, target their right arm. The, the following day, it's the, their left leg, and, and so on. And the reason we know that is because of the makeshift hospitals, who would uh, see the number of cases, specific cases, increasing on on that day. So clearly, they were. Um, playing with, and this is not, I mean, uncommon. Um, it was done in Yugoslavia and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and finally, the uh, capitalist power or neoliberal power where snipers were positioned on luxury hotels. So you see those three different uh, high rises or high structure, 
the religious, the bureaucratic, and the capitalist neoliberal. Um, and uh, and through that, the, the Syrian regime was able to, to take back the, the city. The third chapter is about exploring the different forms of nationalism, and I oppose two forms of nationalism. The official nationalism, the state-centric, that was produced in the past 40 or 50 years to subdue the population, indoctrinate the population, uh, and tell that story of, of the Ba'ath and um, this horizon that we want to have Arab unity and, and so on. And um, on the other hand, there was the popular nationalism, a nationalism from below, a messy nationalism, a nationalism with a thousand different voices. And the reason why I think nationalism is very important is, I mean, as we know from struggles of um, independence and anti-colonization, you need a national narrative to, to, um, to avoid the fragmentation along the ethnic lines and the religious line and, and so on. And I think uh, the Syrian were able, were ha had a successful um, maybe year of uh, rediscovery and uh, rebuilding of that popular nationalism. But then it was taken over by other voices, uh, by Islamist, by, um, by regional and um, different uh, discourses were able to dominate and, uh, and marginalize that, of, uh, that um, popular nationalism. So that's a question that is pending. I think there will be more research uh, on, on, that, um, on that area, but it's extremely important uh, in a time of fragmentation and when the old is, uh, is being dismantled and when the old narrative doesn't stand anymore, what new narrative do we need, do we need to erect? And um, that was the purpose of the third chapter. The fourth chapter was about um, agriculture and land for reform. And oftentimes that's perceived as one of the achievements of the Ba'ath Party, especially the leftist branch of the Ba'ath Party, the socialist Ba'ath Party. And I think there is some truth to that, but at the same time, the land reform in Syria should be understood as a takeover uh, of the peasants. Uh, the peasants were uh, controlled by the notable, uh, the bourgeoisie, um, before the, um, the Ba'ath uh, takeover up until 1963. And uh, the land reform was the best way to control that, that population, that large segment of the population, um, by um, allowing the peasants to take loans, by giving them the, the grains, by uh, 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 the um, uh, questions of the dams and the water and redistribution of the water and, and, and so on, and who has access to what kind of, of land becomes uh, questions of, um, uh, erecting a geography of loyalty and uh, the control of the peasants through through land reform and, and later uh, through uh, agriculture by buying the wheat and uh, the other crops and uh, setting the price. And so you have to have a certain relationship with the state and, um, and the, the state um, dominated the, the peasants um, and the rural population through, uh, through that agriculture and, and land reform. And it ends with uh, the politics of bread. The politics of bread could be understood in two ways. Um, it, can, it is a form of liberation. If we look at the politics of bread, we can understand what was happening in Syria as a way of uh, people organizing and resisting and the different nodes. Um, obviously bread is an essential commodity in time of war and peace, especially in Syria. And so it's a very interesting lens to understand what was happening. But it was also weaponized by the Syrian regime. The Syrian regime was targeting bakeries, it was targeting uh, bread lines, um, it was uh, burning the, the wheat, um, it was buying the wheat from the, the peasants in, in opposition areas at a, more, uh, at a higher price to starve the, the people in, in the opposition areas and so on. So uh, bread was, um, a very important commodity, and I think uh, without understanding bread and the way it was instrumentalized by both, um, and more than both, because uh, ISIS, I think, has a different logic and used um, bread in different ways. Um, so I'm, I'm claiming that we can understand a lot by, by looking at, at bread from below and from above as an instrument of liberation, but also an, as, a, as a tool of oppression. And I'm guessing we'll, we'll talk about the last chapter uh, later on, but yeah, those were um, the four. Great, four thank first. you.
so much. That's uh, very useful for us to conceptualize the entirety. And, and through that, you touch on various aspects of Syrian society, political economy throughout the 20th century, from going back to this early forms of nationalism that people like James Gelvin talked about in his uh, stories of alternative forms of grassroots nationalism way back in the um, end of the Ottoman Empire, uh, to state formation, agriculture, to urban development. So it's a really fascinating tour. Um, I want to, uh, before we get into the uh, discussion about Minbij, just ask you a little bit more about the subtitle of your book, which is this uh, sort of contrast that you paint between the politics of life and the geopolitics of death. Can you just elaborate a little bit more about what that sentence uh, or that phrase means and, and why you chose that as the subtitle for the book? So, um, as I, I mean, uh, explained in, in the beginning, I think that um, the Syrian revolution is in many ways un unthinkable uh, and was invisible for a large segment of the population in Syria and, and beyond. And I think part of that is um, the sometimes theoretical tools that we use to try to understand what was happening. And one of the most lethal tools, I think, in, in the Syrian context is, is geopolitics. I think geopolitics in general is uh, a tool that um, is utilized by the elite, by the dominant classes, to crush um, grassroots movement, local revolt, um, contextual resistance uh, and, and struggles. And, and so um, I was trying to push back against reducing everything to geopolitics. Um, geopolitics can be enlightening, it can be useful uh, to understand the relationship between different states, um, their interest, um, the contradictions, um, the complexity of uh, the international state system. But it's also uh, a way to uh, obscure our understanding of social movement and, and uh, the struggle from below. And so I'm opposing this uh, macro scale, um, the state level and the international level and, and so on, to uh, the struggles that are micro-political, that are about uh, resolving and um, engaging with everyday uh, questions, um, that are about reimagining life beyond the state. Um, I think one of the opportunities that uh, the Syrian had, despite the violence, is um, that um, they were able to uh, experience and experiment with life outside the purview of the state. And that's not necessarily an opportunity that is available to many people worldwide because the state by definition is a colonizing machine. It doesn't like any outside. Um, and it incorporates every aspect of our political and social and economic lives. And uh, we don't really know what happens uh, outside the state. And so, um, so what happened in Syria, especially for what the Syrian state and the Syrian regime perceived as periphery, as non-essential uh, territories, was really interesting because uh, the state uh, and the state inter uh, inter uh, intervention in everyday life was non-existent. And therefore, people had to take their own um, lives and, and try to create uh, the institution and the practices that allow them to reimagine uh, life outside uh, or post, uh, post, post Syrian state. And so I try to, to look at those um, processes, uh, the micro-political and the macro-political opposing them, trying to propose a different reading that is not reducible to geopolitics um, and another thing that I try to do is opposing the politics of life and the politics of death. I'm not trying to reduce um, things to a binary and claim that everything is good on the opposition side and everything is bad on the other side. And I think there are uh, moments of uh, politics of death in the opposition, uh, opposition region uh, when some military factions and ISIS comes over and kill journalists and activists. And, um, and uses some of the prisons uh, that the Syrian regime left behind uh, and so on. When, when in the beginning, they were open to people. Uh, I mean, in a certain way, the first month of, of, uh, of the revolution was an ab abolitionist state. There were no prison in the opposition areas uh, and uh, they were open as museum for people to visit. Uh, and which was an incredible moment and a very powerful moment where people um, saw what the Syrian regime uh, was doing to political prisoners and other prisoners. 
So, so I was trying to use the politics of death and the politics of life as, um, as effective tools to understand what was happening on, on the ground and try to understand the conflict and the revolution through that lens. Great, thank you so much. So let's turn to the uh, fifth chapter, uh, which is titled uh, Participatory Democracy and Micropolitics in Minbij and Unthinkable Revolution. Uh, followers of the Syrian conflict know that this city has changed hands uh, many times, Minbij, and was a site of uh, fierce contestation and battles, especially in the later stages. Uh, however, you focus on a particular time period, which is July 2012 to January 2014, uh, where you refer to a remarkable period of uh, participatory democracy. So explain to us what took place in Minbij during that period and why you think it's so important to tell the story of that city. So yeah, I mean, as I explained in the chapter, I think what's important uh, for, um, for that moment is uh, the disappearance of the state, as I explained earlier. This is a moment when in July 2012, uh, people were chasing the um, the um, uh, security uh, services and the army and uh, the police, and very few people were killed. Um, but they left the state. Uh, they, they left the city. They left Manbij, and um, some of the uh, public uh, employees also left uh, left the city. And so people had all these institutions and uh, those administration. And they, they had to fill the void, um, which is really an interesting moment where um, the state is not present anymore. Um, most of the bureaucracy has disappeared. Uh, a lot of the knowledge and expertise is not available. People who knew how to uh, operate and uh, and and um, provide all these services to 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 the population uh, also withered away, and they were not um, present in the city anymore. And so what's interesting for that moment is that people had to reinvent and reimagine everything and uh, make the city livable um, and, uh, and get rid of the oppressive institution that dominated life in, in Menbej, but clearly were not essential. Um, and so you see a lot of experimentation. Uh, I think well, what is really important in, in that moment is um, people talk to each other. I mean, this is very simple. But anyone who goes to uh, an occupation, for example, uh, the, during the Occupy Wall Street or um, during the current protest, the Black Lives Matter protest, I think one of the most important uh, dimension of those protests and those, um, those moments of organizing and activism is that they create a space where, um, where people can talk to each other and exchange ideas and experiment and get to know each other, uh, which was impossible uh, before then. Um, and uh, and that opens the the the, um, the sphere of possibility, and and so you s I, I saw people from Baathist background uh, and communist and uh, uh, Islamist and fundamentalist and Arab nationalist all coming together and talking to each other. It wasn't always smooth. It wasn't always cordial, and um, and people were beginning to, 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 to talk to each other and learn to talk to each other. So I'm not claiming that it was always a smooth process, but I think it was essential for experimenting and knowing and uh, discovering what is beyond the state and the state violence. Um, and in that sense, uh, that moment was uh, extremely important. Um, there was a lot of mistakes made. I mean, just to give one, and I think I mentioned that in, in the book, is uh, this binary that uh, the revolutionary created, you're either with us or against us, I think uh, came back to bite them and was preparing the ter terrain for uh, undermining, un undermining their, their struggle. Uh, and um, it was limiting the, the, um, the possibility of joining uh, the forces of the revolution to uh, a litmus test people had to have uh, either participate in protest or have donated money. And, and so that limited the pool of the people who were really revolutionary to a very small uh, group. And everyone else was perceived as less revolutionary, as counter-revolutionary, and, and that's uh, obviously uh, insulting. And, and I think that was a major mistake that uh, the revolutionary made. Uh, in addition to the question of militarization, we can talk about that and, and other things. 
Um, but I would say that uh, the Syrian regime, as I mentioned before, was extremely scared of the emergence of alternatives. Um, the longer those areas were, were left alone and uh, were able to, to build alternatives, um, the more th uh, threat, uh, threatening they became to the Syrian regime. And as I said, and as we saw, um, the Syrian regime, yes, I mean, it was threatened at some, um, in some ways by the military dimension of the revolution. But I think it was much more fearful of the emergence uh, of an alternative and that people could think of uh, a Syria without Assad, that Assad is not necessarily essential to the existence of the Syrian state. Um, and um, the slogan, either Assad or we burn the, the country, was um, obviously dismantled in, in places um, like, like Manbij and, and elsewhere. So that was uh, my interest in spending a lot of time in Manbij and um, looking at the practices and um, the experimentation, the way people were uh, doing things, extremely difficult and challenging. Um, I will tell just one story um, that I saw. Um, people wanted to bring the number of uh, students attending school to a higher percentage from 20 to 80. And they had a meeting um the uh the uh revolutionary teachers and um and so the syrian regime uh had obviously an informant and they heard about it and the next day they went and uh, they bombed two schools as um as a sending a message to to the uh, the people uh, in Manbij that uh, you can't have a normal life you can't have education you can't have and uh, reducing everything to the bare minimum just survival and that was what people were facing. Um, the question of survival as opposed to building and imagining. And, and it was always a, a, um, a question of uh, saving lives and rebuilding buildings and providing the essential commodities and, and so on. And I think that was very smart on, on behalf of the regime, uh, always sitting on this borderline of death and preventing people from escaping that space and trying to build on alternatives. Well, thank you, Yasser, so much. This has been very uh, illuminating and useful uh, for uh, everyone to get a sense of what the book is about and uh, why you wrote it. So I hope people will uh, buy it and read it as I did uh, on e-reader. I hope that's okay, but hopefully I'll get a physical copy uh, soon and have you sign it. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, maybe some um, work that you're doing currently is, um, you know, you're involved with a campaign for global solidarity with the Syrian revolution or other work that you're doing on Syria, perhaps uh, to leave us with, uh, uh, with that. Yeah, I think that the Syrian revolution is ongoing in different ways. I mean, there are lows and uh, highs, and uh, we are currently in a moment of defeat. Um, but the Syrian revolution is also part of a revolutionary process in the region. And I think we have to think about uh, long-term um, processes rather than reducing uh, everything to the short, short term. So I'm part of a campaign that tried to um, highlight the struggle of the Syrian um, remind people that there are more than 100,000 people in, in Syrian prison, that they are um, exposed to the most violent forms of torture and, um, and uh, so raising awareness around those issues. And, um, and there are a lot of, I mean, the, the, um, the other thing is that uh, there are so many refugees and displaced people now that we have um, outposts of, of, of the revolution in every major city and capital. And this has a potential to, um, to connect and has been connecting with the Syrian uh, inside. So again, I mean, to push back against the state-centric understanding of, of the revolution, I think it's much more productive to think about the revolution as um, what's happening in Syria, but also in the diaspora along all these different groups um, that, can, uh, that we can learn from, um, because many of them were part of this revolutionary process. Um, so we need to reconnect with them and learn from them and, um, and think about um, the two or three decades from now and what we can do differently to have a successful revolution. Great. Thanks so much, Yasser. Thank you for joining us. Take Thank care. you. Thank you very much.